tally the actual individuals of a, a certain number of these bugs. So we're looking at our organisms at the order and the family level. Um, so where this kind of lies on the taxonomic um, tree, basically, is, um, you know, so for this, you can kind of look at like the grizzly bear, right? And so a kingdom, you would call it an animalia, an animal, phylum, you, you kind of separate out all the organisms that have spinal cords. Then you go down to class, which is mammal, then to order and family. And so when you get down to the family taxonomic level, that is where you would call a bear a bear. But you can see that within that family, Ursidae, we still have quite a bit of variability in just the way that these different bears would look. A grizzly bear you know, is different from a black bear and is different from a panda. So if you were to look at one of those bears to try to identify it based on bears that you have seen in the past, you may not be able to identify a grizzly bear to, to differentiate a grizzly bear from a black bear. So it's important to, to kind of keep that in mind as we um, are looking to identify our organisms because in the major orders that we have, there are many, many families. And within the families that we're identifying, there are many, many species and genera. And so there's a great deal of diversity that is possible for us to find in our streams. But um, you may become accustomed to finding you know, specific types of organism that, that you'll kind of get used to and see time after time um, when you're doing your monitoring. So um, if you ever kind of help out a fellow volunteer in a different part of the watershed, um, or even when you're monitoring your own site, it's just important to keep an open mind, but to also stick to uh, the tools that we're gonna use today. So rather than look at like the pictures on this data sheet that you'll have, you wanna look at the text on your macroinvertebrate ID guide and follow that. So if you don't find a caddis fly that matches exactly to like an image here or a bug that you're used to, you can still identify it by using your macro ID keys. You would just follow it down, you know, the, the line. So the first question may, might be, does your organism have three pairs of segmented legs or does it have pro legs? And so you would just kind of find these small things, these small parts of the organism and work your way down through uh, your identification. Are some basic uh, structures that I'll be referring to during this session. Uh, so I figure we can kind of do a very brief overview of basic insect anatomy. So I wonder if this has like a red dot. Oh, we can see it a little bit. Um, so we have, uh, there's three major body segments on an insect. We have the first segment at the top, that's gonna to be the head. Oftentimes, um, even if the rest of the body is more fleshy, the head will be sort of harder and have this like chitinous cover over it. And so you'll be able to sort of differentiate that segment from the rest of the, of the body. Right below the head, we have three more segments and that constitutes the thorax. Um, so on the organisms that have segmented legs, you'll find them coming off of each segment of the thorax. Um, segmented legs or jointed legs, it, it's referred to in this image, is, is just what it sounds like. So you can kind of think of our arm as a segmented or jointed appendage where we have our elbow and we can bend it. And we have a, a different joint down here for our hand and we have fingers. Um, so it's pretty much the same thing for insects. They have jointed legs. You can kind of see in this image of the mayfly and we kind of have these buff biceps, right? And it goes into the lower part of the leg and you'll find that they have toes or you know, fingers as we're using our metaphor here at the end of um, each leg as well. 
So we can look for each of those structures as we're doing our identification. Different from segmented legs are prolegs, and these are um, not segmented. They're kind of like little protrusions, fleshy protrusions that allow for the organism to sort of, you know, not walk as well as a mayfly with segmented legs, but it allows it to sort of, you know, hop around and be able to, to be a little bit mobile. Um, in this case, the, the prolegs on this organ, organism, this is a midge fly larva. Um, we have prolegs just below the head capsule and also at the end of the body. Um, so you can see a pair of prolegs just under the head and at the end of the body as well. Something else that you might find at the end of the body are tail filaments. Um, and these are very thin, like hair-like projections from the end of the abdomen. Uh, mayflies tend to have three tails. You'll see in this image, we've got a three-tailed mayfly. We can also have mayflies that have two tails. Uh, stoneflies only ever have two tails. So the tails is, is another thing that we can use to try to find out um, what our organism is. Um, abdominal gills and just gills in general, that's another thing that we'll be looking for. Um, they tend to be uh, fleshy and they can be branchy like they are for this uh, net spinning caddis fly on the left here. Or they could be kind of wider um, with a broader edge um, as they would be for the abdominal gills along the abdomen here of the mayfly. So the gills are, are great for us to use when we're in the field, especially because we're looking at these organisms alive. We're pulling them from the stream and we can see them and kind of use their movement as well while we're doing our identification. And those gills are gonna be moving around really, really well. You're gonna see them kind of flapping around trying to find some oxygen. And so that's a really um, helpful indicator. Another thing that we might find are wing pads. So you may remember from Wednesday night that a lot of the insect nymphs that we'll find in the stream have an incomplete life cycle. So they resemble their adult counterparts much more strongly um, than say like a black fly larva, which goes into a, a pupated state before becoming an adult. So for, for these incomplete life cycle nymphs, you will also see developing wing pads on the back of the organism. So in this example, this picture on the right, the wing pads are very pronounced. You can see they're sort of dark and extending, um, elongated over the abdomen. And this would be an organism that is like just ready to pop and hatch um, into adulthood. But these, these guys, they come in different sizes, right? So it could it be that we find a mayfly that has just hatched from an egg. And in that case, the wing pads are gonna be much, much smaller. So it might be a first instar organism meaning it's just hatched from, hatched from its egg and it still has you know, potentially two, three years to go for it to continue to grow and, con and continue to grow these wing pads as well. So just some basic insect structure and stuff to keep in mind uh, as we go forward. So I'm just gonna hit each of these different taxa and we'll look at some distinguishing characteristics and some photos. Uh, these images are great because they're blown up and we can see everything really clearly. But I just also want to emphasize um, that these guys are pretty small. You know, they could be half an inch or smaller. And so while we have the benefit of looking really closely at their body structures here, when we're actually in person, it might be a little bit more difficult because we'll need magnifying glasses and regular glasses if you have them. Um, but I, once you get in the practice, I think it will be, become a little bit easier. All right. So for mayflies, this is the first organism that we'll look at. These will be about a quarter of an inch to an inch long. They do have the three body structures of a typical insect, the head, uh, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head, the eyes tend to be sort of like wide set 
on the side of the head and very well developed. Um, there are three pairs of segmented legs coming off of each segment of the thorax. And you can kind of see perhaps that at the end of each leg, you have one tarsal claw. So you kind of have one toe at the end of the leg there. And I mention this because other organisms that look like a mayfly that are, are not a mayfly have two tarsal claws. So if you see two toes at the end of a leg, it is not going to be a mayfly, only ever one toe. Another super important distinguishing feature that I feel like I'm going to repeat over and over and over as we go um, is that the mayflies will have ills along the side of the abdomen all the way down. You can see here they're sort of branchy um, and there, there would be a lot of movement if we would actually see this organism in person. Um, and these, these gills can look very different according to the different mayfly species. And I'll show some images of that. And at the end of the body, the mayfly has either three or two tails, very slender tails. So the body structure can change depending on um, the, and the habit of the specific species of mayfly that we find. Um, we've got some that are more adapted for free swimming and so they kind of have this like mermaid sort of like glide to their body when they're moving around in the water. And that's very different from a crawler or a clanger that has these really buff arms and you see them sort of walking around on, on the cobble on the rocks. And that's different from the burrowing mayflies that have these tusks at the top of their head that they use to burrow down into the sediment. Um, so these mayflies can come in, in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, here, we're, we're looking at the differences in the tails and the gills as well. So both of these organisms have three tails. You can see in the top image, the tails are, are more feathery, so they're more obvious, I think, to the eye. The bottom image, they're very, very thin, very long, very wide, and, and spread apart. Um, and these both also have gills along the abdomen. On the top, they're a little bit more rounded. On the bottom, we have a mayfly that has more forked gills. So they kind of like will stick out and then fork. Um, but in both of these cases, if we were looking at these organisms um, alive and, and moving around, we would see those gills in action. And here is another look at some of the variability of those gills. Um, so in the top image, we have gills that are pretty much um, limited to the first couple segments of the abdomen. So right at the top of the abdomen, we'll see some feathery stuff kind of sticking out. And then for this organism on the bottom, this mayfly larva, the gills are, are really rounded and enlarged, and they basically cover that's the first couple segments of the abdomen. And so it kind of looks not like other gills, right? Because it's on top of the body. Um, but this is also another one where when you see it in person, you'll see that that soft tissue sort of move. And that will be an indicator to you that there are gills along the abdomen. And here's a look at what that might look like in action. You can kind of see, um, there's a, a more of like an exoskeleton for most of the body of this mayfly nymph, but the gills are definitely moving. Um, so we, we will collect them in our buckets and it's kind of like a low oxygen environment. So they're going to be trying to, to get as much oxygen as, as they can. Um, so we're going to, you know, we can work through this sort of quickly so we can return them back to uh, their regular habitat. Um, these are organisms with larger wing pads. Um, so some of the organisms that we just saw, we were really not seeing that sort of that like V-shaped structure over the top of the abdomen. Here you can see these are very, very enlarged. So we're also going to have some variability in the, in the wing pads. So just in general body structure, I mean, the head of the this top organism is 
much more narrow. This bottom organism is much wider. We call that one a flathead mayfly because it has a, a flat head. And so there's a, a lot of difference there as well. But the important things to note for mayflies is we have gills along the abdomen and we have two or three tails at the end of the body. The stonefly is a similar organism. Uh, it looks sort of similar to the mayfly in that it has the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. It has three pairs of segmented legs, so six legs coming off the three segments of uh, the thorax. Um, but for the stonefly, it will only ever end in two tails at the end, never three tails for a stonefly. So if you see an organism like this that has three very thin hair-like tails at the end, it's not a stonefly. Um, stoneflies have two tails. They also will tend to have longer antenna at the top. So, uh, you know, in relation to their, the rest of their body size, the antenna tend to be longer for um, stoneflies. The gills, you will see hopefully that there are no gills along the abdomen for a stonefly. Uh, the gills here are limited to the, th the thoracic segments under each pair of legs. We call them uh, hairy armpits very scientifically. So we kind of can see uh, there's like a, a little bit of movement under each of the legs um, if we were to see this in person, but now we can kind of see like a more branching gills. But here's another look at that organism. We have very obvious wing pads on this particular specimen, but again, um, sometimes they're not as obvious. Whereas all the mayflies that I showed before have different types, branching, elongated, forked, squarate gills along the abdomen. This stonefly will never have those gills along the abdomen, as we see here. But we can kind of see that we have um, the branching gills sticking out from the thorax instead. Um, so also in this image, you can see kind of that this, the stonefly has two tarsal claws at the end of each um, segmented leg. So remember the mayfly just has the one toe. Um, stoneflies and other organisms that look like this have two. So you can kind of see they're kind of like sticking out right at the end of each leg. So stoneflies can, you know, just as with mayflies, um, we can see variability in the different sizes of the body and, and structures of the body. Um, they can come in different colors, you know, they could be sort of transparent and clear and yellow, like the, the top image stonefly. Um, or they could be brown and dark and, and have kind of look stockier like the bottom stonefly. There is one particular type of stonefly um, that kind of looks different from everybody else. This is called the roach-like stonefly for obvious reasons. Um, it has the same structures that we're looking for though. So you, this is kind of an example of how we don't wanna look at just the, the body and kind of get used to the same organisms that we find. We wanna look for those structures. So do we have three pairs of segmented legs with two toes at the end? Do we have two tails at the end of the body? Do we have no gills along the abdomen? And for this one, it has gills on its thoracic segments. It has those hairy armpits, but the, it's kind of this like forked double gill sticking out under each arm um, rather than like the, the more branching gills of the other stoneflies. Um, and this is another one um, that can be a little bit confusing. And this is, this is definitely one that is helpful to find in person and, and alive, um, because you might look at this organism and say, hey, we have protrusions along the abdomen. Those are gills. Maybe this is a mayfly. Well, I don't know if you can see very well on this image, but you can see that there are sort of branching gills coming out from under each segment of the arm. So you can kind of see it poking out um, under this, the top left arm and the bottom uh, left arm. 
And so we have gills along the thorax here. And on the abdomen, this is actually just an extension of that exoskeleton, not gills. So if we were to see this organism in person, we would see the gills on the underside of the thorax, maybe moving around while these structures on the abdomen would stay rigid. And so this is a stonefly, not a mayfly. All right, on to damselflies. The damselflies and dragonflies are basically cousins. They have a lot of structures in common with each other. Uh, but damselflies are a little bit more delicate. They're thinner, they're more slender. Um, and they have, at the end of the body, um, they have three gills. They kind of look like three tails at the end of the body, but they're more paddle-like, they're wider. Um, I'm not sure that this, uh, in the next image, I think we'll get a better look at, at those gills at the end of the body. Um, but something else that is really important to look for is this grasping jaw, this, this lower jaw that extends out, remember, to grab its prey and bring it back um, to feed. Um, so this just kind of shows you how they're, how they're sort of slender, they're longer, and this is uh, much different from the dragonfly larvas that we'll find um, that also have that mouth part. So in this image, you can sort of see um, we have the three pairs of segmented legs along the thorax. We have that head capsule up top, no gills along the abdomen, but we do have three structures at the end of the abdomen. So rather than, than tail-like, um, or hair-like tails at the end of the body. These are more rounded. And again, you'll kind of see those move around. These are the gills. So those are going to be uh, sort of mobile as we're um, moving them around. So this is a look at um, a damselfly larva in action. You can see that prehensile labium coming out to snatch that. I think it's a mosquito larva <laughs> um, to bring it back in and to feed. And um, if you have dragonflies or damselflies in your tray along with other organisms or any predator <laughs> in your tray along with other organisms, um, you might see this action uh, take place in front of you. Uh, and so that's also something to sort of uh, keep in mind when we're separating out the organisms. We don't necessarily want to put um, tiny little midges in with big dragonflies or damselflies because we're just, um, you know, making lunch for them basically. And it might mess with our counts of um, the actual population of macroinvertebrates. Um, so in this next image, the damselfly larva um, has no gills along, if it will show up potentially, it's slow. Um, but the damselfly will never have any gills along the abdomen. Um, those gills will be at the end of the body and they can look thinner, somewhat uh, more similar to the mayfly tails at the end of the body, um, but you should be able to see them move. I'm trying to get this image to move forward here. It's not working. One moment, I'm gonna stop and reshare. Got stuck on the GIF. Okay. I think that should do it. Can you guys see the, the uh, PowerPoint? going on here. Stop share. Huh. It's 
talk amongst yourselves. So I've got two laptops going. I think what I'm going to do is uh, pull it up on this one. One moment, please. But yeah, if anyone has any questions at this time, please feel free to shout them out. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, so that should work. Um, yeah, so what I, as I was saying, um, the, the damselflies can have those gills at the end of the body that look a little bit more hair-like. So this, some of them, it's much more paddle-like, they're wider, um, but you'll see here, they're a little bit thinner. And so it's possible maybe to mistake this with a mayfly larva, perhaps. But again, one of the major differences that we're looking for, does this have gills along the abdomen, along the side of the abdomen? No, we only have the gills at the end of the body. The mayflies will always have gills along the side of the abdomen. So we can clearly say it's not a mayfly, and so it is a damselfly. Something that will help us, as I mentioned, are those gills at the end of the body moving around. So you can see here in this image, they're kind of like up and then they they're kind of are, you know, just shifting around in the tray. Gills are also very sensitive structures of the body. And so they tend to fall off, <laughs> put it bluntly. So if you really kind of mess with the sample a lot, if you sort of kick, or job to collect your sample vigorously, it's possible for those, those gills to come off. And so um, this specimen at the top, this damselfly larva only has one tail. So sometimes we have to have other things that we're looking for to make our um, identification. In this case, we would be looking for that jaw, that labium on the underside. So we would just flip it over and see if it has that sort of mask-like feature on the bottom. We can look at the number of toes at the end of each leg. Um, so depending on your screen, you might be able to see um, that these do have two toes at the end of each leg. So just to summarize the differences between these three, again, mayflies, gills along most or all of the abdomen and one tarsal claw or one toe at the end of each leg. Um, they could have two or three tails. The stoneflies will only ever have two tails and they will never have abdominal gills, but they may have those visible gills along the thorax, those hairy armpits under each um, segmented leg. The damselflies have that mouth part, that, that kind of mask-like jaw on the bottom of the body. So we can flip it over, over and look for that. Um, and then it has these paddle-like tails at the end of the body, which are actually the gills that you'll see move around. Dragonflies, as I mentioned, are the are cousin of the damselfly larva. So they will also have this prehensile labium, this jaw that can come and extend out. Um, we do have our head capsule, our thorax, and our abdomen, um, three pairs of segmented legs, each with two tarsal claws or two toes at the end of um, the leg structure. Uh, but at the end of the abdomen, um, we have three wedge-shaped spikes. And so they're kind of like pointy, like a pointy M at the end of the body rather than a damselfly larva that has those three gills, the, the wider paddle-like gills. Whereas the damselfly larva were more slender, more lithe, a little bit thinner, the dragonflies are a little bit stockier. They're more bulky and they have wider abdomens. 
So if you were to flip one of these specimens over, you can see maybe what I mean in the left image here, the dragonfly nymph. We have the mask that's covering the, bo the bottom of the head. And so if you were feeling, you know, sassy while we're out in the field, you could take your forceps and kind of pull out that mouth part a little bit and you can see how, how it extends out. This is uh, in contrast to the mayfly larva, which is the image on the right. Um, and this has just the bottom of the head um, without any mask, without any a lower lip covering the head. And let's hope this doesn't ruin our PowerPoint again. A gif. Aha, okay, good. Um, so the dragonflies can come in different sizes. Again, uh, the image on the bottom here, we have very well-developed wing pads, pairs of wing pads sticking down these sort of elongated structures over the top of the abdomen. Um, this, this organism on the top here, these are both dragonflies, um, but also the three spikes at the end of the abdomen can be much different sizes. They're much more obvious on the organism on the bottom rather than the one at the top. They're, they're, they're there, but it's a little bit harder to see. But even if you don't see that, you know, you can always um, flip it over and look for that mask, that jaw on the bottom of the head. So here is just uh, some few more pictures of different types of dragonfly larvas that we might see. And you can see the differences in those wedge um, shaped spikes at the end of the abdomen, as well as just the general structure of the body. Um, they can sometimes look a little similar to uh, spiders, you know, with, the, with an incorrect number of legs. These will always have three pairs of segmented legs while spiders would have four. On to the next organism. These are our case building caddisflies. Now I just wanna mention, so for caddisflies, this is a, an order level um, that we're identifying. Caddisflies, this is Trichoptera. Um, that's a, that's, it says family, but it's actually an order. And so there's one family that we pull out from our, the rest of our caddisflies that we identify separately from all the other caddisflies. And so first I'm gonna go over the, the caddisflies in general, and then we'll talk about that one specific insect. And the reason that we uh, identify it separately is because it has a higher pollution tolerance value. And so remember, that's why we're collecting those bugs. That's why we're um, counting them up and, and measuring the population because we wanna see what the average pollution tolerance value score looks like. So the case building caddisflies have a lower pollution tolerance value. They can be found uh, in, in cleaner streams. They can be up to about an inch and a half long, but they tend to be quite a bit smaller than that at about a half an inch. Uh, they have a segmented body, just like the other organisms we were looking at. But this looks a little bit more like caterpillar. It's more sort of juicy um, along the abdomen than the other specimens we were just looking at. Um, it does have the head capsule. It has uh, the three thoracic segments, each with a pair of legs coming out. And we have the abdomen. And at the end of the abdomen, we have a pair of prolegs, each with one claw at the end. So if you look at the end um, of this abdomen, you can kind of see those legs sticking out with those hooks. And um, this is a, another look at a case building caddisfly. Um, this is an example where those, the prolegs and the hooks at the end of the body are much more obvious. So you can really see it's kind of sticking out those legs at the end of the body. Um, while that last image, they were much tighter. They were much closer to the body. But in both instances, it's the same, you know, we're looking for the same thing. A pair of prolegs each with one claw at the end. They can come in a wide variety of colors. 
Um, and so it, it, it's actually an interesting indicator we can use if we wished to identify these further down to um, family or to genera, but color is actually a, a helpful indicator to do that. But we're just stopping, we're just calling these caddisflies at the order level, no need to go any further. We would classify all of these the same. Here is another look. Some of the um, jaw structures, the mouth parts of caddisflies are very wide and sort of just very large and obvious and distinct. And so you can kind of imagine it sort of shredding material leaves as it comes by. Um, so in both of these, uh, we have very distinctive mouth parts, have our three pairs of segmented legs, and we have our pair of pro legs at the end of the body, each with one hook. Um, you'll see that the legs on this top caddis fly look a little bit different than some of the others. And because these organisms can be found in a case that they create themselves, some of them have an adaptation where their front pair of legs are much higher and they kind of stick out of the case. So you can imagine like a sleeping bag sort of covering the rest of that body and we just have this one front pair of legs that can stick out to help uh, the caddis fly move around while remaining in the case. Here are other types of caddis flies. You can kind of see uh, how interesting these mouth parts can be depending on the type of caddis fly you find. Um, with these, it almost looks like the mouth is sort of stuffed with cotton. Um, and you can see that very obviously um, when you actually look at these organisms in the field, you have this bright orange head. Um, this is the phyllopotamidae, and you can see this kind of white cotton sticking out. But they all again have that head capsule, three pairs of segmented legs, a pair of pro legs at the end of the body, each with one hook. Now, if you find one of these caddis flies inside of its case, there's no need to take it out of the case. Um, you would just want to check in that case and make sure that you know someone's home, basically. If you find a case like this, it's really cool to see one in person. Um, but you, you know, just poke in and see if, if, if someone's living in the case, and then you would count it as an individual. If you find a case without a live specimen inside, then you would not count that as, as an additional organism um, for your tally sheet. So it's interesting though, that the caddis flies, depending on um, their species, they create very specific cases. Um, some of them will only create this, this sort of square, they'll like rip parts of leaves and make it into a square around their body. Some will only use bits of sand to create like a, you know, kind of a harder, more bulbous, sandy structure. Some of them create cases that are sort of helicocycidae, they kind of make a rounded case or they kind of like will fold up inside of it. And so there, there's a lot of variability among these cases as well. And it's cool to see and, and hopefully we will see them. And this is what that, those cases look like actually out in the stream. So you can see in the top image, we have the, a, a piece of cobble here and adhered to that cobble on the top, we've got it maybe you know, 15 different cases that have it adhered to that cobble. So when we sample, we want to make sure we pick up that rock, right? And we're, and we're gently rubbing the top of that rock surface to loosen these cases um, from that, from the rock, from the cobble, so that those cases can go into our net and we can count it as part of our sample. Um, so these, that's like a very well-defined case in the top picture. In the bottom picture, it's more like, it looks more like clumps of rocks. And um, this is just another type of caddis fly case um, where, <laughs> sorry, my cat, um, where the, um, cases, you, you can still sort of rub them, scrub them off of the larger rock, um, but they, they can look, you know, different depending on the species. So here's an example of one who's, who's making a case out of, excuse me, thank you, 
um, out of basically anything they find, right? So you can see there's like a snail shell sticking um, to, to the side of this caddisfly. We have bits of leaves, we have twigs. So this guy is just really working with whatever he can find. Again, the caddisflies secrete this sort of substance that helps um, all of this stuff stick to them and while allowing them to be mobile. So it's just like they're making a house uh, on the move. Net spinning caddisflies are the one type of caddisfly that we will separate out. Um, so these other caddisflies, again, the po pollution tolerance values are like three and four, perhaps. This one, I believe, is like five or six. It's much more commonly found than all of the other caddisflies. Um, so we, we you know, need to count it differently to make sure that we're um, assessing our streams appropriately. The net spinning caddisflies will not build cases like the other caddisflies, but they will spin those nets on the side of a rock and kind of hang in the nets and let the food come to them. Big distinguishing physical characteristics that you can look at to differentiate the net spinners from the rest of the caddisflies. We have under the capsule head, the three thoracic segments. And perhaps you can see each of these segments has a hardened plate on the back of each segment. Um, other caddisflies will have one hardened plate or two hardened plates, but the net spinning caddisfly is the only one that we'll find that has three hardened plates. So if you see these three hardened plates on the thorax, you can kind of assume that this is a net spinning caddisfly. The other really big thing to look for are these very uh, obvious branching gills on the underside of the abdomen of the net spinning caddisfly. Um, it will look sort of fluffy on the bottom, um, whereas the other types of caddisflies won't have those gills on the underside of the body. So you kind of flip it over, look for those gills, look for those three plates, and that will help you to um, make your identification. So here's a look at the caddisfly inside of its case in that net that it builds. And the net spinning caddisfly is similar to any other caddisfly. It can come in, in different colors. Um, and so, you know, don't get used to the color. You just want to look for those body structures. Again, the three hardened plates on the back of the thorax and the bushy gills on the underside of the abdomen. Um, these also have a pair of um, pro legs and hooks at the end of the body. And there can be um, gills at the end of the body as well. So in both of these cases, you can see sort of branching gills at the end of the body um, too. And so this is uh, what it might look like if you're actually, um, you know, pick up a piece of cobble to sample um, for macro invertebrates. Uh, so we can see we, that kind of net structure in that top image, and we have rocks kind of hardening um, that case, and the organism is going to be inside and just waiting for that food uh, to filter right in there. So again, we just want to gently sort of scrub it off of that rock to get it into our net. Major differences between uh, the caddisflies. Net spinning caddisflies always have three hardened segments on the thorax. Case building caddisflies will only ever have one or two hardened segments. Um, obviously the case building caddisflies, you may find them in a case. Um, the nest spinning caddisflies will instead the net, or um, you may find them just kind of free floating and not in a net, not in a case or anything. Um, the gills on the underside of the abdomen are, are maybe the most obvious thing to look for. Um, so you can kind of look for those branching gills, on the abdomen, if you see them, then it's very likely a net spinner. The Helgramite or Dobson fly. So I, I may use these words interchangeably. I found that I have no control over how I describe these bugs. Um, so the Helgramite is the term typically used by fishermen. And um, this is really popular to use for, for bait 
for fishing. Um, and Dobson fly is maybe the more like scientific term um, to refer to uh, these individuals. But either way, it's the same thing that we're talking about. These, if you're noticing the sizes as we go along, a lot of these organisms are like half an inch, maybe to an inch long. Algae mites can, become, can really grow to about four inches long. Um, they can be very large. They're very dark. They tend to be like black or dark brown. And they just look scary. They, they kind of look like they're gonna munch your finger a little bit. And that's because they can. This is that example of um, the organism that has a really strong jaw at the top of the head. So you can kind of see the jaw separated right at the top of the head, it just can kind of like pins together to eat. So you stick your finger there, yeah, that, that could definitely happen. Uh, but the filaments along the abdomen, you can kind of see these hair-like structures coming off of each segment of the abdomen. Um, those are, are soft, those are not um, a, a hardened structure like the top part, like the thorax and the head capsule on this Dobson fly. The abdomen is segmented and soft and the same with those filaments on the side coming out of the side of the abdomen. Um, at the end of the body, again, we have a pair of prolegs, each with a pair of hooks. So there's a lot of different things on this, on this organism that can help us to uh, identify it. It's very distinctive. So here are other looks kind of, um, you can kind of see with the hand, the size of this thing. This is quite a bit larger than uh, a lot of the other macroinvertebrates that we'll find. And you can see how, how large that jaw is and how obvious those filaments are that are coming out of the side of the abdomen. Occasionally the Dobson fly will have gills on the underside of the abdomen as well. And so you can see those gills moving. Um, it's, they may have gills, they may not. It's not a requirement that you see gills to identify it as a, a Dobson fly. But I just wanna mention it just in case you do see a Dobson fly with gills. The alder fly is, it's probably what is confused with the Helgramite the most often if you're looking at it on a computer screen. If you're looking at it in person, um, you'll see the size difference and just like the structure of the body will look a, quite, a, quite a bit different. But the reason that these two are confused is because this also has those lateral filaments, those hairs that are coming off the side of the abdomen. So in here, they're kind of like pushed down a little bit. Um, we also have powerful mandibles as those jaws at the top of the head, um, but they're not as wide set. And also because of the size of this organism, it tends to be about an inch or smaller. Um, it's not gonna be able to pinch your finger just because it's too small to do it. The other thing to look for with an alder fly is it has one single tail at the end of the body. So Helgramites have the, the pair of pro legs, each with a pair of hook. This alder fly just has one single tail. So here again, we can see those mandibles at the top of the body. We have the three pairs of segmented legs. And I hope you can see the difference between these segmented legs and these filaments that are coming off of the rest of the abdomen. The legs, you can see the joints, you can kind of see there's different structures to the legs, while the filaments is just one long, uh, you know, extension of the abdomen, basically. And we have that one long filament at the end of the body. So the major differences here, we're looking at the mandibles. The Dobson flies are going to have much uh, larger and, and wider jaw at the top of the head than the alder fly. They both have those filaments coming off of the abdominal segments. Um, the Dobson flies will have eight pairs. The alder fly will only have seven pairs. But honestly, it's unlikely that you'll be able to count um, the filaments on the alder fly because it is so small. Um, and so at the end of the Dobson fly, we have uh, the hooks, 
versus the one filament. Um, and just looking at these in person, I think it will be much more obvious that they're so different. On to our beetles. Um, are there any questions? I don't know, Debbie, if you, um, there's anything that you want to toss out from the chat. Or if, oh, I see, I see we're sharing pictures of the adult Dobson fly. That's that's pretty scary. You can kind of see the Dobson fly uh, jaws in its larval phase. And as an adult, it has these this huge tusks basically that stick out from the head of the body. Oh, am I not allowing you to unmute yourself? I get it, okay. Let's see. My bad. All right, Debbie, so I should have. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, there was one question that, um, that somebody asked and I wanted you to answer and I'm pretty sure I know the answer but I wanted you to answer and, and it was, um, do you count the macroinvertebrate if you suspect that it is dead? Great question. Yeah. Um, so you would count the macroinvertebrate if you believe that you were the one that killed it. So if you think that it was the process of sampling that you know did it in, basically, then you would still count it because it was alive before you came to the stream. We try to be as gentle as we as we can as we get these organisms off the rock or off of leaves into our nets, um, but sometimes it does happen. Um, if you find an organism that is like decaying at that point where it's really dead and it's obvious that it didn't like just happen, then you would not count that as an individual. Um, and just, yeah, just remember for the caddis size, if you find a case, just make sure that there's someone in the side of the case before you count it as an individual. Was that, was that good? Was that it for questions? I think so, okay. So we will move on to our beetles. There are a few different beetles that are commonly found in our streams here in New Jersey. The riffle beetle larva is one where we can find actually both the larval phase and the adult phase in the water. They're both aquatic. Most of the, the larvae that we'll find are aquatic during their larval phase, during their juvenile phase. And then they come out and they're terrestrial and they fly around in the air. Um, the beetles, we do find them in their larval phase here, but we will also find them in their adult phase. In their larval phase, they kind of will look like a caddisfly, um, but the entire body is very stiff. Um, it's covered with an exoskeleton. The, the, the caddisfly tends to be more fleshy, um, and this tends to look darker and be a little bit harder. Um, it's deeply segmented from the head capsule to the, the three segments of the thorax to the end of the abdomen. And the end of the abdomen can um, sometimes be pointy or it could have white gill tufts at the end. So let's see if we have an image of that. Here we go, yeah. Um, so there is an operculum at the end of the body that can open up basically to allow these gills to come out and, and interact with the water. Um, so it could be obvious gills at the end of the body or that operculum could be shut and we may not see any gills. Um, these do not have the prolegs at the end of the body like caddis flies do. Um, they do have three pairs of segmented legs at the top on each segment of the thorax but they're quite a bit smaller than uh, the, the segmented legs on the caddisflies. And also these can be 
quite small. These, the caddisflies can be small too, but they tend to be like an inch. Um, riffle beetle larvae here are, are maybe a half an inch or smaller. And sometimes when you, when you see them in your tray, they kind of just look like little C's, like little black kind of commas basically in your tray. And so it's hard, um, since they're so small, sometimes it's hard to look at, at each distinguishing characteristic, but you can see these really, you know, structured black commas. And those will tend to be our riffle beetle larva. The adults look more like a typical beetle. They, again, have the head, the thorax, and the abdominal segment. These can be very, very small, um, down to like a 1 16th of an inch. Um, they're super, I don't know if you can kind of visualize that, but they're very, very small. And they just look, um, it, it's helpful that there's so few beetles that we'll find in the adult phase in the water. So when we do find something that kind of looks like this and has that beetle body, then we can go ahead and classify it as a riffle beetle adult, according to our data sheet. Water penny beetles are another type of beetle that we will find, um, but these are pretty distinctive. They have that enlarged exoskeleton over the back sort of covers all of their soft tissue and, and allows them to blend in with the rest of the rocks with cobble or, or gravel. Um, but if you were to look on the underside of that water penny, like this image on the right, you can see it has the same body structure as something like a mayfly. It has a head and it has three pairs of segmented legs and it has gills along the abdomen. It just so happens that we have this really enlarged sort of back on the water penny beetle. Um, so we'll find these, they, they can camouflage themselves very, very well with the rock. They're, they can be sort of flat on the surface of the cobble. So we'll make sure that we're rubbing those rocks, not only to pull off our crawlers, our mayflies, or our cases uh, with our caddislies, but also to get these guys, to slide these guys off of the rock very gently. Um, so look at how wonderful that camouflage is. Um, it makes it great uh, for the water penny to avoid predators. And I suppose in this case, we are the predators. We're kind of hunting for these macroinvertebrates to count them up. Um, so it's it, when you get out there to actually collect your sample, your, your eyes sometimes need to sort of adjust to the organisms to really find them on the rocks and on your net and to um, include them in your sample. Water snipe flies, we're, we're getting into the dipterins, the, the fly uh, order now. Water snipe is the first type here, but it's probably, probably the least common, the one that we will very unlikely that we'll see it in the Railway River or the rest of New Jersey. Um, but it does have a, a very pointed, head at the top. So the top of this image, that's the head. The bottom of this image, that's the, the end of the abdomen, that V shape, that's the end of the abdomen. So we have this pointy head um, and this tiny little head that sometimes can stick out. Sometimes it's sort of hiding within the point of that um, top thoracic segment. Um, these can have prolegs on the underside of the body. So if you look at it from the side, you can kind of see the, the prolegs sort of sticking out at the end of the abdomen. Um, and then at the, at the end, you've got that V shape. And that's gonna be very large and very obvious if you see that V shape along with the prolegs and the pointy head, then you can basically identify the organism as a water snake. So here, uh, this bottom image is, a, is another look, kind of a side profile of those prolegs. See them sticking out on the bottom of the organism. In both of these images, we have that pointy head up top. Uh, the head is retracted in this top image and it's kind of sticking out in that bottom image. So the head is like really, really small. And then we have that V shape 
at the end of the body. More images of the water snipe. Uh, sometimes the, the V shape can have hairs along um, the end of it as well. So that's another thing to look for. Crane flies are another type of fly. They're more rounded than the water snipe. They're a little bit um, juicier, I guess. They're more caterpillar-like. Um, so they have that rounded head up top. And just as with the water snipe fly, they can have a head that sort of pokes out or they could have it sort of retracted into that first uh, thoracic segment. At the end of the body, we don't have the V-shape like um, the water snipe fly. We instead have uh, these like finger-like projections from the end of the body we call spiracles. So we'll get a, another look at these spiracles at the end of the body. There we go. Uh, yeah, so we, we can kind of see them sort of branching at the end of the body. The spiracles can look very different depending on the type of crane fly that you find. Um, in both of these cases, you can see that tiny little head. And in fact, uh, on the picture on the top, you can even see the tiniest little baby antenna sticking out from that tiny, tiny little head. Oh, he's so cute. I love the crane fly. Uh, and the segments along the body are, are much more obvious. You can see we kind of have this rounded um, structure around each segment that helps you really define um, each abdominal or thoracic segment. Here's another look at different types of cream flies. Sometimes they can have some oddities. So they will always have that rounded head. They will always have the spiracles at the end of the body. But sometimes they could also have a very enlarged final abdominal segment. So this image on the top left, we have that sort of bubbly <laughs> segment on the end of the abdomen. Um, it kind of looks strange when you see it in person it, and it might throw you off. But again, as long as you have that rounded head, the spiracles at the end of the body, um, you are likely looking at a crane fly. The bottom image shows another type of crane fly we might see that has um, not pro legs, so much on the bottom of the abdomen, but like pro pro legs, um, very small um, sort of bits that uh, allow the crane fly to sort of move around on rocks. And so you may see that, um, but that's not very common. Black fly larva look a bit like a bowling pin. So they have a um, more narrow section just below the head. The head is at the top in this image. And we have the thorax and we have the abdomen and it extends into sort of a wider end, a more bulbous um, end of the abdomen. And at the end of the abdomen, we have, I have another cap. Thank you, sir. Um, at the end of the abdomen, we have sort of this, this sticky, um, substance that allows for the fly to sort of burrow into sediment and, it, and it's able to kind of stay stable in the stream. So as the water is flowing, it can use that to stay in, in one spot. And these um, have those mouth parts at the top of the head that allow it to just filter out fine particulates from the water column. So it's just, they're kind of a little forest at the bottom of the stream and uh, filtering out food as they need to. There's a, a pro leg just below the head. So the image on the bottom here, you can see we have the head on the right side of the picture and that pro leg sticking out. And we have the wider end of the abdomen. Midge flies are another uh, organism that are very, very common. That It's likely that you'll find some type of midge or another in uh, almost every sample that you collect. The midges can vary hugely in the size and in their color. Um, this is probably on, on the larger scale, so you can actually see um, the segments of um, the, the body and you can see the prolegs at the end of the body. We have a pair of prolegs at the end and also just below the head capsule. 
So here's another look that that head can be very different depending on the type of midge we find. Um, on the top image here, the midge has very distinctive, a very large head. You can see, again see that pearl leg right below the head and the pair of pearl legs at the end of the body. Now the, the midge fly larva on the bottom here has those same structures. They just look a little bit different. The head is much smaller in relation to the rest of the body, but it again has that head and the pro legs just under the head and at the end of the body. So here's a, a look at pretty much all the different types you might see in the stream. And they can be bright red. Um, some programs will differentiate the midges that, that are blood red, they call them, um, from the rest of the midges because they might have a higher pollution tolerance value. Um, but for our data sheet, we classify all midges the same. So we can look at all this diversity, but we're just recording them all as the same thing, a midge on our data sheet. On to our crustaceans. We have scuds. These kind of look like shrimp. Um, another word for the scud is a side swimmer. And that's really helpful to remember because you will probably see the scud on its side swimming around in your tray. These guys are pretty much always on the move um, and they're always on their side. So you'll always see them at sort of this perspective, um, you know, flat on the bottom of the tray. Sow bugs are more flattened from top to bottom. So these are, are like the aquatic roly polies. Um, and um, we have seven pairs of segmented legs along the entire body and one enlarged abdominal segment right at the end. So you can see um, at the left side of this picture, that's the end of the body. That's the end of the abdomen. We have that one large segment there. Um, and at the top, this image is sort of hard to see, but we have two pairs of antenna at the top. But I just wanna show the scud again. The scud also has seven pairs of segmented legs, but it is kind of like hunched in on itself. You will always find it on its side swimming around in the tray. The sow bug is more modile with, with its legs. So it's more likely to walk around rather than swim around. So that's another thing that can, can help us distinguish them. So here's a look at these side by side. They don't look super similar, I think, in, in these pictures here, but um, in person, you know, it may be harder to tell. Um, so the scuds, the movement is going to be super helpful, looking for them swimming around on their side in your tray. Um, and the sow bugs are flattened from top to bottom, and they will always have that large abdominal segment right at the end of the body. Crayfish, we know what crayfish look like. They can come in a, a, also a wide variety of sizes. I think we're probably used to seeing the larger crayfish. Um, just, you know, you went hunting for them as a child, you would find the larger ones. But we can actually find cray, crayfish that are quite small, like a half of an inch to an inch long. And in those cases, the body might be a little bit more transparent. And so you may even um, confuse it with a scud if, if you find a preserved example of a really small crayfish and a preserved example of a scud. Um, but these are different in that they have, you know, very um, large first pair of legs with those pincers on the end. Um, it has uh, the ability to kind of pinch you, I guess, if you pick it up in the wrong place. So this is one where you want to pick it up by the abdomen. Um, rather than by the front of the body, so you don't get pinched. Right, so here on the, on the right-hand side, this is a smaller specimen, I think. Um, not the smallest, but on the smaller side. So you can kind of see how it, we might be able to confuse it with other crustaceans like the scud. 
Um, and this image on the top, this is one that has really large pincers. It looks like a lobster, basically. For all of the organisms we've looked at so far, we've been looking at them on the order and on the family taxonomic level. For segmented worms, we're going to move up to class. So we're classifying a lot of different organisms that we might find under these very simple categories, leeches and aquatic um, earthworms or aquatic worms. So leeches, uh, they're flattened from top to bottom. They have deep segments along the entire body and they will have those suckers at both ends of the body. Um, you'll, you'll tend to see them move around in the tray so they'll like attach their sucker to one end and they'll like stretch their body really, really long across the tray and attach that sucker and then like release. And that's how they kind of move around the tray. And that movement is helpful really for us to identify the leeches when they are alive. The worms, there's a huge diversity of worms that we might find. And all of them we would classify just as aquatic worms. They could be more cylindrical and look more like a you know, a plump earthworm that we're used to. They could be really thin and hair-like, bright red, where they almost like turn to mush in your net because there's, there's just like no body structure there. Um, they could have short hairs along the length of the body um, or they could not. They could have one bulbous segment of the abdomen similar to the crane fly that had that sort of bubble at the end of the abdomen. Aquatic worms can also have that as well. Um, so there's, yeah, huge variability here. Um, but it's more difficult to differentiate different types of leeches and worms. So we're just staying very high level um, with these identifications. So uh, just a little more closely at leeches, we can see the difference in size, uh, body structure, and color. So this one up top, this is a very common type that we'll find. There's, there may be like a half an inch long, white, sort of rounded. And at first glance, you might think that it's a part of a seed or something. You, you kind of <laughs> poke it a little bit. And you might see the, you know, the body start to move around and that helps you with your identification. Or you can be very long and, and live and dark colors, bright colors that they come in every color. So here's a look at, at what it might look like as it's moving around in their tray. They just kind of use the suckers to like attach and then keep moving. So if you see this kind of movement, then um, you've definitely got a leech. Aquatic worms are more cylindrical, right? And um, yeah, they're worms, you know, we'll find worms. How do you identify a worm? It's wormy, I guess. Okay, so on to our mollusks. We have uh, clams and mussels. And this is another one we're identifying at the class level. So very high level. We're not differentiating between different types of clams for different types of mussels. We're not differentiating between invasive mussels or clams versus native mussels and clams. Anything that is a clam or a mussel is categorized the same on our data sheet, clam or mussel. Really important thing to remember, a clam or mussel has two parts. It has two pieces to its shell with a hinge at the back. So, um, this is one where you want to make sure that there is a live, you know, that, that there's soft tissue inside this organism. You don't have to like break it open or anything to look inside. Um, if it's if it's still shut closed, then it's alive and you would count it as um, a specimen. There's types of snails, and I'll show a picture of those in a minute, limpets, that almost look like the top of a clam but they don't have the hinge. They don't have the other side of the shell. It's just the top part has the shell and the bottom is just soft tissue. So for clams, we always wanna make sure we have the hinge and the two parts. 
snails, we're classifying into two different categories. We're still at the class level, very high level, but we do want to pull out the lunged snails from the gilled snails. So you might uh, infer from this that the gilled snails, because they are gilled and breathing underwater, they have a lower pollution tolerance value than the lunged snails. So they, they are, are quicker to die off under polluted circumstances. So we wanna make sure that we're classifying these differently. The gilled snails, if you were to basically face the shell with the opening facing towards you with the pointy bit at the top, gilled snails have the opening on the right-hand side. Lunged snails, if you put them in that same way, you know, the pointy bit at the top, the opening facing you, lunged snails will have the opening to that soft tissue on the left-hand side. So you can sort of think of it like left-handed is lunged, right-handed is gilled. Uh, lunged snails also include basically any other kind of snail. So if you have limpets that just have the top shell, if you have um, rounded like orb snails that really don't have a pointy top, so you can't determine you know, which side it kind of opens on, all of those are going to be lunged. So really the only difference you need to look for with that pointy bit at the top, see if it opens on the right-hand side. If it does, it's a gilled snail. Every other type of snail is a lunged snail. So just um, you know, to really drive this home, the gild is good and it opens on the right and the left-handed snails are lunged. So they breathe air. Okie doke, so we're gonna meet our dichotomous key now. If you have that document from the email, you can open it up. Um, I think Debbie may have put a link into the chat as well with, um, with a link to that document. So we'll work through it together for this first organism. And then we will get some practice moving through some of the others. So a dichotomous key, it's like a choose your own adventure book. You look at your organism, you look at the key and you answer specific questions to get to your end result. With this, uh, there, you know, there's millions of different guides and keys out there. Uh, we use the Stroud macroinvertebrate key because out of the tons of macroinvertebrates, it focuses on the ones that um, we actually count. Um, so the first part of this key, does this have jointed legs or no jointed legs? So take a look at this organism here on the left. And I will ask you, does this have jointed legs or no jointed legs? Jointed legs, yeah, so we see um, we have the head capsule, we have the thorax, and we have those three pairs of jointed legs coming off the top. And they're striped, so they're very obvious in this specific case. Okay, so the next part of this question, after jointed legs, we would count how many jointed legs. 10 legs or more would, would put us in the crustaceans category. Eight legs would put us in the arachnid category. Um, but this one has six jointed legs, so we would flip to page three. Once we get to page three, the next question is about cases. So if you find an organism inside of a portable case, that's only going to be your case building caddis fly. This one, oh, I'm not seeing it inside of a case. So we can go to the right side of our key, no portable case. Now, this is where it can get tough. Does this organism have wing pads present? Might be hard to see on this picture, but we have this, this kind of darker, 
structure at the bottom of the thorax sticking out. So the very beginnings of wing pads starting to protrude over the end of the abdomen here. So this does have wing pads. I think that this might be the biggest weakness with this specific key. Because if you find one of these specimens that um, will have wing pads as a larger larva, but it's not very obvious as a very small larva, um, then this might not get you to where you need to go in the key. Um, so we're going to work through it, and I and I hopefully with practice, we'll be able to identify organisms that will potentially have wing pads as opposed to the ones that are very visible. So we do have wing pads. We're going to page four. And I, I included this picture to try to show off those wing pads a little bit more, change the image. Okay, on to page four. The next question is about tail filaments. Does this have tail filaments or not? This has three very obvious tails at the end of the body here. So we can say, yes, it has tail filaments. Now we're deciding between these three types of macroinvertebrates, the stoneflies, the mayflies, or the damselflies. Now it's not a stonefly because stoneflies only ever have two tails. So three tails or two or three tails, but this has abdominal gills, right? Can we see it's kind of branching soft tissue coming off the side of the abdomen? So we've got three tails with abdominal gills. And we have decided that this is a mayfly. All right. <laughs> Pop quiz, you know, just kidding. It's more like practice. So I think that if you have the key in front of you, take a look and work through it. And I'll give you like 30 seconds to a minute to look at that key, start from page one, go through the questions. And let's see if we can identify what this is. Well, we've got the correct answer in the chat. I love that. Yes, so here we have a midge, right? No segmented legs. We have pro legs under the head and at the end of the body. Beautiful. Midge fly, all right. This next one. You don't have to travel as far, I think, through the key for this one because it's got a lot of legs. Yeah, so we have some consensus in the chat. Excellent. This is a scud. Perfect. All right, on to the next one.
So we have three pairs of segmented legs. So that's six segmented legs, not in a case. Wing pads for sure. Two tails, but we do have abdominal gills. So we are a mayfly. Yeah, so if this was a stone fly, it would also have those two tails, but no gills along the abdomen, a very smooth abdomen. This one, we, we definitely have those gills. All right, let's take a look at this one. So these have very small wing pads, very small. Kind of see this V shape here on the thorax. So we can see those wing pads. Right, so here we have a damselfly. We have the three tails, what look like three tails at the end, but they're actually a little bit wider. So those are gonna be our gills at the end of the body. And we have that smooth abdomen, no gills along the abdomen. So we have a damselfly, excellent. Let's go with this one. This one is a little bit tricky, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. Right, so here we have a riffle beetle larva. Looks similar to the caddis fly larva, but it's darker. It has that hardened structure for the whole body. So remember the caddis fly, at, right below the head, it can have those hardened plates on the first, second, or third thoracic segments where the, the legs are, but the rest of the body is gonna be more fleshy. So this, is hardened all the way down. And it's kind of hard to see at the end of the body here, but we don't have those pro legs at the end. Instead, we have that operculum where those gills might be poking out a little bit. Excellent. I think just for time, um, we'll skip pop quiz part two. <laughs> But I will share this PowerPoint with everyone. So if you want to take some time and just kind of go back through um, these images and, and also go through this next part, you know, this pop quiz part two, I think that might be helpful. So here's just an example of like what um, the next series of slides are helping you to differentiate between um, two types of organisms that may look a little bit similar. So I suppose let's just do this one and then we'll move on to the end. Um, so the one at the top. What are we thinking? Yep, we've got an aquatic worm on the top. It's wormy, it really doesn't have a whole lot of other body structures that we can really see, make out. On the bottom, we have an organism that is also blood red, it has a, a distinctive head capsule. And something that's very hard to see in this image, it's got a pair of pro legs under the head and at the end of the body, 
you guys have it in the chat. That is a midgefly larva. Excellent. Yeah, so let's um, speed through these. And I just want to get to a point, um, the point in this presentation where we can talk about Sunday. And I wonder if we can go out on Sunday. Clea, what are you thinking? I'm gonna try to unmute. I don't know why it's forcing people to mute. Oops. Okay. Hello. Yeah, yes. Hi. Yeah, I've been looking at the weather report for the last two days and praying that it was going to change, but it looks really bad. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I I do agree. I hate that I that I'm seeing the same thing too, but um some people are thinking it's going to be a little bit more optimistic and that thunderstorms are going to start later in the day. And while I think that's true, it's going to be some pretty intense rain early on in the day too. And it's like, it's going to rain for three days and Sunday's the middle day. So I don't see how it's really going to change that much. You know what I mean? Like if it was like the last day, sometimes the rain finishes and then you have the good day. But if it's the middle day, I don't see how it's going to change very much. Right, right, right. Yeah. Believe me, oh, I was like, I was really bummer. hoping it would change. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, me too. I mean, um, basically, so at this point, um, I think we have to talk more amongst ourselves to make a final, final decision. But in the, the survey that I sent out, the link for at the top of this uh, session. It does it ask you to indicate all of the dates that you would be available for an alternate training day or um, testing day. And that goes into the first weekend of May. So um, it, if we can't get it together this weekend, and if, I don't know, we can't get it together next weekend, depending on everyone's schedule, then we'll, we can go from there and perhaps um, I'll check your survey results or we can do a doodle poll if we're really having trouble finding a date that works best for good, everyone. Good. And thank you so much for doing that survey because you know that'll really allow us to be able to make a good decision that will let the most amount of people you know be able to make it. Right. And it and it, uh, you know it might be a situation where will break the training into groups. So like if half of the group can, can come on one day and half of the group can come on another day, um, you know, hopefully Debbie, we can, can work around that and get enough trainers to be available. Um, that's our limiting factor is because we're breaking into groups because we do have such a large group, um, we have to have enough people available to teach all this stuff and, and who kind of know what they're doing out there in the field. So, um, and it, does, it does help to have a little bit more time because, yeah. you know, sometimes you just kind of things start glossing over in your face, like your, your mind, like the, the bugs start <laughs> like, like blending into each other. And sure. so if you can break it up, it's, it's better for you to absorb like what's going on. So, yeah. 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 I, I agree. I agree. I, I don't know, um, I can't really see people's faces, but sometimes this, this presentation that we did tonight can be a, a little overwhelming for people. You know, we're talking about segmented legs and, and wing pads that you can barely see. And so sometimes, I don't want anyone to get, uh, Jackie, I saw your magnifying glass, that's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want people to get discouraged. I mean, I, I really think the, that this is stuff that we can, master and it just takes practice and so if we need to do it over multiple sessions uh, that's what we will do for sure and and i think once people get out there you know it, it it gets really fun because once you start 
being able to recognize things. It's like, oh, I found this and I found that and it gets exciting, you know? So yeah. I think that'll really help take it off of the virtual realm and into reality. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, well, I, I'll just go over this really briefly and then um, we can uh, figure out the details later. But when we do meet for our field training, I figure that we'll meet here at this spot this is pretty much in downtown Rahway uh, on Whittier Street at the Rahway River. So it's kind of River Road meets Whittier Street in Rahway. And there's street side parking along that area and lots of grass uh, for us to spread out and, and um, really to be able to accommodate the most amount of people. But I just wanted to mention, so as you're going forward with your own stream sites, there are a few key things to look for. Um, making sure that you have safe parking and a safe spot to access the stream is really important. Um, you want to make sure you can wade into that stream. If you're collecting macroinvertebrates, it's got to be a wadeable stream, which means that the depth can't be too, too high. The flow can't be way too fast. And you have to uh, have macroinvertebrate habitat available to sample. So um, these are all the important key parts to picking a good site. And I think that uh, CLIA will be, um, you know, we'll have like a, an established network of sites that we will decide. So you don't necessarily have to, you know, figure all this out yourself. And I believe Debbie talked about this yesterday, but it's always good to talk about streamside safety more than once, I think. Um, so you always want to monitor with at least one other person. And like we are doing today, checking weather ahead of time just to make sure that the stream is not flowing way too high or too fast uh, is really helpful uh, just to fit everything into your schedule. And of course, too, you, you know, it's important to be aware of vegetation in the area. If you see poison ivy, don't go like rolling around in it, you know, and there's also some stuff you can take out with you to kind of help first aid kits great thing to have when you're doing field work. Tech new, extreme, this, I, I, you know, they don't pay me, but I would do advertisements for them regardless. This is kind of a, a, a medicated scrub. You can get it on Amazon for 10 bucks. And if you feel like you got into poison ivy when you're on the field, you come back, you take a shower, you scrub this stuff on your skin for 30 seconds and you rinse and it's, you know, it's gotten all those erushial Oil By the off. way, I have poison ivy on both of my hands, on the, both the palms and the outside. It's horrible. I don't know. I never learn, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'll send you an Amazon package with some tech new. I yeah. have some. I don't know why. <laughs> I just didn't use it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Poison ivy. It's, it's, we're getting into the part of the year where it's going to start growing like crazy. So that's, Definitely something to, to watch out Well, the out problem for. is when the leaves aren't out, it, you can still get it from like the vines and stuff. And that's even harder because if the leaves aren't out, you don't know <laughs> that it's there. Yeah, yeah. No, but, but it's still, those oils are still there for sure. All right. Well, so I so think- One, one thing, one time, one question before we go. So- Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when, like, what if we wake up tomorrow and it's like, all of a sudden everything's changed or we can do it on Sunday? Like, when are we going to let people know, absolutely, we're not doing it on Sunday or, or are we just calling it now? Like, what are we doing? Debbie, what do you think? What, is, what, are you, as, what does everyone think? I don't know. I'm going to, okay, allow participants to unmute themselves. Yes. There we go. Okay. People should be able to unmute themselves now. Um, maybe, maybe tomorrow morning you can check and then let people know. Yeah, but so but maybe by, I guess it's not looking good, but. So by email then, you're gonna email. Everybody. Yeah, if it was if it was just going to be a light rain, then yeah, we have to be a little tough and, and get out there. But a heavy yeah. rain is going to make the, the water uh, muddy and um, 
sure. you know, make it harder to see. Could, if it's enough rain, it'd make it unsafe. And, um, and also unpleasant, <laughs> so. Right, if it's your first time doing stream monitoring, you kind of want to do it under great conditions, <laughs> not, <laughs> yeah. not while you're miserable. So that's another thing to consider. Oh, the, here we have the Jobson fly adult. <laughs> I have one question. Wow, what claws are they? So those, are those aren't actually, they look really scary. And so as in the larval phase, the, the Helger might, those jaws will get you. As the adult, they only use these to mate. So they use it to hang on to <laughs> the jobs and fly in front of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have one question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I just wonder, is there any um, uh, bathroom there? I mean, uh, Johnny John or any place where you can go to the bathroom or not? Yeah. Okay, there is, okay, so we're, we're right near the Railway River Park and there's a concession stand, um, but it's sort of like on the other side of the park from where we'll be, so. Um, how far, how you far is it? have to, get in your car or you can walk but it's it's a little bit of a hike okay. i would say it's like a five minute drive maybe i mean okay. less than five minutes it's like a mi one minute drive you know yeah, but it's a yeah. little bit it might be just a little bit too far to walk okay, okay. yeah thank you and there's this uh fried chicken shack that's <laughs> a quarter mile from the site i just you know if you want to make a decision <laughs> that is always good yeah <laughs> We can always communicate to you, Erin, uh, uh, if we decided if we'd like to go to pursue or not to pursue. Yeah, yeah. You can send me an Are email. Are you the one, the main contact to, to follow up on that? Yeah, I think that's fine. I, I'll put my um, email in the chat again, just in case oh. you guys have my email okay. address from prior emails. But here's my email in case anyone needs to, has any like last minute questions. Um, and, uh, you know, people said in the chat, if we let you know by 5 p.m. tomorrow um, that that would work for you, that I think that's great. We might probably make that decision earlier in the day, but uh, we'll send that by email and okay. um, then go from there to, to reschedule a new date. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Erin. Earlier is better. I agree. I agree. All right, well, if there's no other questions, you know, you guys have my email, you can send other questions. I will send those uh, presentation PDFs over to you all now. And uh, I hope you have a really great Friday night and weekend. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye.